Welcome everyone to Lockdown Lecture Series. I introduce Angela Kasparic to get us started. Hold on, Angela. Me again. Oh. Now you're good to go. Oh, thank you, Darren. Um, this is the second in a series of workshops that the iSpace team is hosting, and we want to thank you for joining us today. This is going to be recorded, so if you needed to follow up or you wanted to rewatch it again, we just wanted to let you know ahead of time. But this is a virtual workshop. We like questions, we like participation, and we want some interaction. For the first section, we're going to have Charles Loss and Jay Groot give us a demonstration on some of the troubleshooting, some cases that require, you know, just a, some common cases, but that require a little extra work. During the cases, if you have questions, please enter them in the control box that's on the panel located to the right of your screen. I will relay the questions to them. Towards the end of the presentation, we're going to have everybody ask their own questions or if at some time we're not catching your question on the control panel in the message box we'll we'll definitely make sure just unmute yourself and ask us this is something that we want to have fun we want to know what your questions are some interaction and if you wouldn't mind we'd like you to take a picture of yourself and send it to the, our iSpace email and we'll put it on the website and promote your practice. We were able to do that with a few of the practitioners from last week's presentation and it was a lot of fun. So give me a moment here and we are going to welcome Jay Groot and Charles. Join me in welcoming them. Hey everybody, how are you? Good. And Charles, are you there? I'm here and just welcome to everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in for the next session. So this session is gonna be a bit more on a different format than the previous one. And in the sense that we're gonna do live troubleshooting. So I've asked Jaguar to put together some interesting cases, which we're gonna run through and then pull into iSpace and then do a number of designs with those maps just to give you an idea of what the natural design flow would look like, as well as the things we would look out for when we use maps and when we design lenses for them. So handing over to Jagrut, he's gonna take us through his first map. Right, excellent. So um, I suppose the best place to start is uh, when we are capturing our maps. Uh, the first place that we obviously review our maps is in our map capture software. This is an example using one of the products that we uh, use within our um, suite of integrated topographers. Um, and this is the Medmont. I do realize that there are also some other topographers out there that we're also integrated with, such as Oculus, um, or the Oculus suite, and Pentacams, etc. The theory essentially is very similar, or very much the same. The one thing about what we're doing at the moment with uh, in this lockdown lectures or the lockdown lecture series is um, we're looking at different ways of practicing. Um, and whilst many of us have used, uh, you know, trial fitting sets um, uh, for many years, now might be the time to have a look at virtual fitting. With respect to this example, um, what we're looking at here is uh, the variability that you can have with improper capture. So obviously there are limits to virtual fitting and with our software we try and account for these limits. But today we thought we'd go through a couple of the examples which you know, uh, can really affect the outcome. So Charles, if you're having a look at this map here, um, what would you like to be looking at when you're um, assessing it for its quality, um, the type of map that you've got that you're looking at? Well, the first thing we're looking for when capturing maps is one, we want a geometrically centered map. In other words, when you look at the Placido rings, you want those rings to be equidistant to the limbus. So just having a look at this map, um, I can already see these, uh, these are decentered capture that occurred here. So if you want to walk us through, through that quickly, Jagrit. So I'm just taking this ruler caliper measurement here and you can see that's the end of the limbus there, which isn't even captured in the, 
capture screen, and then you've got Limbus over here. So this is obviously showing us that we have quite a um, de-centered capture. So what does that mean? Well, it affects the way that the pupil is captured by the software. You know, pupils don't necessarily always look like this. Um, it's going to create improper reflections. You also want to have a look at the upper lid and lower lid here. Okay, so this is what we mean by a decentered capture. If w the reason why we look at the Placido image is just because it really easily shows it. You can still see this information if you dial up your opacity uh, with which, whatever software you use, and you can you can see how this map has been interpreted. Remember, a Placido-based uh, topographer will look at the reflection and it will apply an algorithm to it to calculate what it believes is the um, the shape of that eye. This is the axial power map and this um, essentially tells us about some of the refractive optics. The refractive power map is also used for this as well, okay, with just a different color representation. When we're having a look at this stuff, we want to have a look just to the side. Um, I'll just move this along. Um, you're going to see over here, you've got your flat K and your steep K and the delta K. We then have a series of indices, and each um, software company, uh, or capture software company, has a variation of this. This is the traffic light system that um, this company uses. Um, this is the inferior superior index, essentially looking at the top half of points and the bottom half of points. Then you have the surface asymmetry index, which is the it's called the SAI. Um, John Mount wrote a paper many years ago, anything over 1.26 within this. Uh, particular uh, uh, set of metrics is, you know, diagnostic of a, a really um, a regular cornea and surface regularity index. And this is the one that uh, the, the lecturers at Medmont tend to talk about. Now, I noticed that there was a question there. Um, is there a question there or is there just a comment? Okay. Yeah, keep going, Jagger. I think that uh, just a comment. Okay. Okay, cool. All right, excellent. Um, so when we're having a look at when we're having a look at all of this, what we're looking at is um, essentially its position. And then remember, when we're virtually fitting, the this corneal data goes into the software, and then it will, um, and then we build a lens on top of that. So I've taken a series of these maps in this example. Uh, let's just skip to the second to last one. Uh, I'll show you these just as we go through. So Jagra, just to add to, to what you're saying there, um, the reason why we don't want uh, to capture or decentered captured maps to import into our space, there's some research that shows when you measure an aspheric shape using a Placido disc ring system, and that capture is not done on the geometric center of the cornea, but slightly skewed, it affects how the algorithms then analyzes the cornea and the data that gets pulled into the software for any software for virtual fitting is slightly erroneous and that influences the accuracy of your design so the very basic concept before even starting to design lenses is to ensure that you get that well-centered map captured now the easiest way to do this is to ask the patient not to look right into the center of the bowl of the Placido disc uh, topographer, but slightly nasally. Um, with the Medmont, for instance, you're looking at the first or the second red ring uh, to the side of the nose. With the Oculus, um, it's a very similar process. Uh, with the bigger um, Placido disc head, uh, you tend to have a bit less of these decentered issues, but you can still ask the patient to look at the first ring nasally and that should help to capture the, the topography map in a more geometrical fashion. The other one that I like to look at is um, look at the tangential curvature map. With the tangential curvature map when you capture specifically what we're aiming to see is what I call this island in the sea. So if you look at that map if you can go back to standardized curvature Jagrit that's it. Imagine that yellow and green section being your island and then the blue section the peripheral part of the cornea is the blue sea so for a good map you want to see a circular round island with this blue sea sitting around it that will tell you that you've captured a good map just on a visual basis so the moment your island shows any distortions on the edge i call them little, um, 
little inlet, or if you're talking an island term, that shows tier defects. And again, it can influence the accuracy of your map. You'll see that analogy also correlates quite nicely with your SRI values. If you look at the image on the right, your SRI values got that orange color, that yellow color there, uh, which is a warning that there perhaps might be some distortions, mainly coming from tear defects if it's a normal cornea. Whereas if you look at the image on the left, you can see that round island, and immediately you can see all the indices are green. So that's how they will relate from an indice perspective to what you can visually see on the map. So when I capture with the Metmon, for instance, I like to switch it over to tangential curvature and every map that I take, I'll have a quick look and see if I get my island in the sea pattern, which really tells me um, I should get a good map from there. Yeah, so that's actually an excellent point there, Charles. It's a nice visual way to look at it without having to really look at the numbers, but obviously the numbers are really important as well. Um, one other point for this is that um, in that example, yes, we talk about one and two rings and all of those sorts of things, but if we're going to really analyze this in a way that's kind of meaningful for this discussion, this patient that, that we captured, that is looking straight down the very middle of the placido camera, so the black dot on the center. This is looking at one ring, this is looking at two rings, this is looking at three rings, and this is looking at four rings. So the main thing that I'm trying to look for whenever I'm deciding on a map for virtual fitting is I'm trying to make sure it's equidistant here, equidistant here from the limbus, equidistant here, and as best as I can here, with a, with a good aim to remove as much of the lead and lash line as possible. It's, I understand that it's not always perfect, but um, this is part of virtual fitting. The other thing to note is that if you have a look at the flat and the steep K here in this, uh, what I would regard as a well-centered map, and then you review the same, the same eye, but captured on a different angle, you see there's some variability there. Um, and that variability leads to um, potentially a variable in outcome. Now with our software, what you can, what this algorithm does is it will try and design the best lens for it. And, and a lot of the time it will do a very good job. Now, next step from this, is we always want to have a look at the elevation because this always tells us you know where a lens will land when it gets uh, placed onto an eye and this is part of virtual fitting so shah do you want to just walk me through elevation here and what you see here uh, again the the essentials for what we're looking for for a good map when designing so keep in mind this is not a full explanation of what elevation maps are used for but just a quick cursory check before you import your map is you look at the blue so essentially the lens will, will try and move more in the direction of where the blue is most and what you're aiming for in a good map is symmetry so in this case you can see Jagrid is showing uh, the blue at the the left side versus the blue on the right so there, there is a sense of symmetry there um, if we go to the map on the right there, for instance, you'll notice there's more blue. There's a darker blue towards the inferior than the superior. So that can be a slight indicator that the lens will have a slight tendency to move in a down fashion. And again, that's just showing astigmatism as well. But there's not too much asymmetry there and we should be okay. You might, for instance, find a map where the blue is only in one quadrant of the map and not in the other, meaning there's quite a, a asymmetrical elevational difference in, in that particular map. And that can be a clear sign that the lens will decenter into that direction. And so on a normal cornea, this should not be a, a case of, of where you can see this. Um, and therefore you need to be a bit careful of that fit. Um, and sometimes it might be necessary to design a quadrant specific lens to try and stabilize the lens, but it is unusual to see an asymmetrical elevation on a, on a standard normal cornea. So the basic thing to check for here would be that difference in elevation. Now what Jagger is showing there is again one of these decentered captured maps and you'll notice there's, there's a huge amount of difference in elevation between the nasal and temporal side 
this is a skewed data point because you captured the map at a, at a skewed angle and therefore there will be an elevation difference. So this doesn't naturally occur in the cornea. If you, Jagri, this is the same map. So if you, if you um, analyze the map on the left versus the one on the right, it's the same eye. The one on the left is captured decentered, where the one on the right is captured on the geometric center of the cornea. I noticed the massive difference in elevation that you see between these two maps. So the software, if it uses the map on the left, has to take into account this elevational difference and will try and design the lens accordingly. And you will result in a certain type of lens design, where the one on the right the software will analyze the data a bit differently and therefore might result in a slight different lens design. And so this is why it's key that even before we start designing lenses, we have to get the most accurate map captured for the data to be accurate and therefore the end result to be accurate. And this is what's going to save you a lot in troubleshooting, essentially. So. Um, let's actually go and design a couple of lenses, one on the map on the left and one on the map on the right for the same eye in iSpace. Within each topography platform software, you have a linked applications area. You click the iSpace button and it imports the map directly in. And this is our variability example here. Just by the way, this is our, um, our little topography viewer um, that we use when we're analyzing maps and all those sorts of things for troubleshooting. So that's really helpful. So, um, Jagrit, um, just, just to show, we're currently in iSpace, so the, mm -hmm. the map's been imported. Jagrit selected the, the map on the left there. Um, so, we're just searching for our patient. He will then click on the patient. We'll go to the right eye. And once he's clicked it, he'll click on the map. And you can yep. then use this analyzer built into iSpace. This unfortunately only works with the, the Medmont topography maps. Um, and so from there, you can then analyze the elevation, the axial power, the tangential powers, and so forth. So it will show exactly the same information as what you can get from your topography unit. The other nice One, feature uh, is what Jagger is showing now. And that's where you, if you highlight any two maps, it'll immediately take the difference. Okay, now obviously these are two pre-wear maps, so um, that's gonna show a, a bit of an odd difference there, but that's a bit of the, a, one of the little features in the software that and I think it, use. It's important to know, Jagrid, if you wanna pull them both up, how to do that is you, you click control and you click left. And for those in New Zealand, if you see my screen moving, we just had a slight earthquake there. Wow. Um, which is fun. So <laughs> um, if you look at the two maps, the top and bottom, so they, these are both pre-maps. So no AuthorK has occurred here. Notice the difference in data from the same cornea. So this is the same eye taken on the same day. Top one is decentered, bottom one is centered. And just notice all the, the elevation difference and, and corneal data difference between these two maps. So again, just highlighting the importance of taking a good map. Okay, so um, just a quick stop pause here. I've been noticing a couple of notifications. Darren, are there any questions or comments that you need to share? No questions uh, so far, but I did want to remind everybody to snap a selfie of yourself watching the lockdown lecture series. And uh, the best one will be featured on the Facebook, uh, Ice Space Facebook page. So back at it, mate. Awesome. So um, let's look at the not so ideal map first and let's design a lens. Um, so if we go into here and we go into Forge and we want to measure the Placido image, the first step that we're always going to do is measure our HVID and we want to go dark to dark or light to light, whatever your preference is. In this case, Charles, what would you do here where you've got and placebo image, it's not so ideal, but you still need to measure an HVID. Do you have well, a comment see, on how you'd approach yeah, that? Yeah, see, that's the problem with this map. If, if I was doing a, a troubleshoot and somebody would send me in a map like this, my comment back to them would be is, unfortunately, we can't use this map. Uh, would you mind just bringing the patient back and recapturing a, a better centered map? So 
at the moment, we're going to have to guess what that HVID is. So unless we know specifically, uh, we'll just have to get a good estimate. Um, what I would do in this case, because we have a good map um, as a second capture, I would go there, measure its HVID, come back and then use it on this one. So some of the, um, so these are some of the challenges that we have with um, virtual fitting, but they're not certainly not insurmountable. It's just when we're first capturing our map, taking a little bit of extra care will yield even better results, reducing chair time in the long term. For this particular case, let's just pretend that this is how we've measured it, okay? And we'll compare it when we design the next one. We need a prescription. Have we got a prescription from the crowd? What can we, what do you want to design? So I think it's an 050, it might be a one dot still or something. Anyone? Want to anyone want to call out a prescription there or in the comments? About a minus. Yeah. Minus two fifty minus one at ninety. No. I just want to remind anybody: if you want to speak, just click the unmute button and um, just uh, bring your conversation online. We honestly don't mind you asking questions. This is supposed to be an interactive session so uh, please feel free to ask questions make comments or, or just you know make a suggestion and we can see what happens when we apply that suggestion okay so just before we um, use that is uh, the we we'll probably want to have a couple of couple of chats here around a few things the first thing is going to be okay this is a really good example of looking at the prescription and looking at the, um, the pre-corneal astigmatism. So we wanna have a look here at the mat, the pre-mat. Um, we've got a certain level of, let me just try and make this the right size for my screen. We got a certain level of astigmatism that's in here. Yeah. I just do, Oops, sorry. Now our pre-map was, showed how much astigmatism, let's have a look. Our pre-map shows 1.2 diopters of with the rule astigmatism. So, the prescription that was called out was very, very valid, but it does happen from time to time where you may have internal cylinder and the prescription that we were trying to correct here is minus one to up is at 90. So shall just, just for the sake of discussion and because it was um, brought up, what would you do here if you had a with the rule cornea, but you had a spectacle prescription with a one to up the cilia against the rule? Um, so it's a valid question and it gets complex very quickly. Um, so let's go through the whole fit step by step and, and then we'll, we'll get to the internal astigmatism. Perfect. So the first thing yeah, I will yeah. always do is just look at what iSpace has designed. And first step always for me is go to the bottom right page and, of the page and we look at that simulation of the lens fit. And the first thing we want to concentrate on is the tilt function. So for okay. those of you who have been with our lecture last week, knows that we need to tilt this lens. So looking at the tilt, there's, uh, the blue in that simulation shows the area of most contact, that we most bearing of the lens on the cornea will occur. Now, this is a artifact of virtual fitting and we just need to correct the software so that the lens is balanced on the cornea. To do this, we go to the tilt function. So Jagrid, if you can just show us step by step, once we've done the simulation, um, on the, the top section of that simulation, there's a tab that says simulation, tilt and position optical analysis. So Jagrid clicked on the tilt and position tab, which then brought us to this page, simulation. So we always want to click those, one of those four circles on the opposite direction of where the blue is. So Jagger is going to click on the 90 and the software will re-simulate the software with the lens 
tilted more towards the 90 degree or the 90 degree point on that lens. So we've got blue at the top, we've got blue on the left. So we're gonna again go to the opposite where the zero is and then click again. And note that we're not changing the lens design, we're just improving the simulation of the lens on the eye. And what we're aiming for is to either have two areas of blue horizontally on the lens, or to have this tripod positioning of these three dots in a triangular format. And this will show us that the lens will stabilize on the eye and not tilt. So what do we mean with tilt? If this is your cornea, the simulation show the lens sitting slightly skewed on the cornea. Now this is typically more so when you use maps that are decentered, which we know in this case was. And so we're just asking the software to simulate the lens with a slightly tilted action until both the alignment curve positions on the opposite sides of the cornea bears down on the cornea. So once it's done this, we'll ask the software to optimize the lens design again, since we've changed the relationship between the lens and the cornea itself. The software will reanalyze the data given the new tilt position and then optimize the software accordingly. So what we see now is the blue is now in a triangular format, meaning the lens is balanced. The next step we want to look at is um, just the overall fit, the edge lift, for instance. We know for these lens designs, we're going larger, as we explained last time. The formula now is we 0.2 millimeters smaller than the HVID. Since we've guesstimated the HVID to be 11, the lens design uh, came out as a 10.8 millimeter lens. So if you look at the lens parameters on the design page, under diameter, you'll see there's 10.8. Um, Jagrid, if you can just show them there, they're 10.8 in the diameter. So these are our value there. So the next thing we'll look at is the edge lift. Now, because we're going larger, there is a risk of the lens bearing onto the vertical alignment, uh, limbal area. And to ensure that we've got appropriate edge lift, we want that edge lift to have a, a clearance of about 100 microns. So we Jagrid zooming in there. We do that by drawing out the mass, drawing the box. Yep. Letting go of the box. And we can see the edge lift is sitting approximately at about 60 plus microns. So we're looking at the top of that triangle and we will do this over the horizontal meridian. So we want that to be between 80 and 100 and closer to 100 if we can. So in this case, we want to lift the edge lift a little bit. So to do that, we're going to go to edge radius and then put a flatter value into there. I'm guessing about 10.2, 10.4, roundabouts where we need to be. Drag it, we'll click apply and the software will redesign the lens with the increased edge lift. And we can see on that cross section of the tier profile that we are getting closer to the 80 micron mark. So let's bump it up a little bit more. We'll go to 10.4 and that should give us a, a good edge clearance for this design. So that would be my second step is first, always do tilt, optimize. Next step is get the edge lift right and we'll now look at the design. Now, the interesting thing that I see here is if we look at the alignment curve angles between nasal and temporal, superior and inferior, we can see it's got a, an, an unsymmetrical design component to it. So if we look at uh, the zero degree area on the alignment curve on the cross section, so we're going to the top simulation showing us the cross section. We can see the alignment curve's got a quite a down angle slope. It's very toe fitted. Whereas if we go on to the opposite of that meridian, you'll notice that the, the angle um, is not as steep. So if you click apply Jagrut, so if we can go to the default um, simulation. So if you look at the top section, which shows you the horizontal cross section by default, you'll notice on the right side, it's got quite a down angle, whereas on the left side, it's almost flat. 
in other words the the heels coming down the toes slightly up where on the other side it's more inwards the same applies also for the superior and inferior areas so your first thought is ooh maybe i should go with a quadrant specific design here um, and if this was a well captured map that is something we would have considered but again we have to just remind you that this map we're using is not ideal it's decentered um, and so this will be the result in the design is to have this really uneven unsymmetrical design um, fit pattern coming from from that cornea so these are the kind of things that we want to look at so let's go and look at the optics so if we look at flat k and steep k on the design page so we go to that column b that middle section and you'll see the flat k is 43.42 and important for me is i look at the axis at at four degrees if we look at the spectacle prescription we can see the flat axis is sitting at 90 degrees. Um, so looking at the corneal astigmatism, we know it's with the rule, but if you look at our spectacle prescription, we're dealing with an against the rule. So that immediately is a warning sign for me. It means we, we're dealing here with lenticular astigmatism. Now, a quick way for you to check is say add to cart and the software will when you do add to cart will bring up a design page and it will show you what the residual astigmatism will, will be when you place that lens on the eye and immediately we can see there is a minus two residual astigmatism so that is your warning sign if it's more than a minus 075 minus one that's typically a good sign not to go ahead with with doing this ortho design so some of you might say hang on but can't we just change the back optic zone radius can't we do a toric so let's have a look at that if jagrit wants to cancel um, and now when we look at the design itself let's look at how the lens will orientate onto that cornea so if we look at the bottom right section where the lens simulation is, you'll see these two line engravings. Now those two line engravings will show you where the flat axis of the lens will be orientated onto the cornea itself. So in our case, in this design, the lens will sit in an oblique fashion. Now our principal meridians for the corneal topography as well as the spectacle prescription is 180 uh, 0, 180 and 19 to 17 whereas our lens orientation will be oblique so even if we change the flat and steep axis of the back optic zone radius the way it will orientate on the eye is not in relationship with where the powers on the cornea is and therefore it won't work if we change the back optic zone radius so if this was a live case uh, at this point, I would walk away from this fit. I would not go ahead and uh, design a lens for this patient. This would be an example where we would then um, have contraindicated signs and we would then stop the, the fit. So if you bring this to me as a, as a troubleshoot, I will go through all this data and my comments to you would be is unfortunately at this point, this fit won't work, but what I can see is from your topography map, the capturing was not as best as we possibly could do it. I would suggest to go back and then recapture the map and see if we can get more accurate data. So this is a, a clear example of how capturing a, a map can get you into trouble and end up giving you a, a contraindicated fit. Now, if we say take that same lens design, and uh, we use the, the appropriate map. Let's go through that design process and see what happens. So step one is obviously we've selected the map we want to design from. From there, we want to measure the HVID as near as possible. Whenever you can't get exactly horizontal, you just go as oblique as possible. And you can actually now see that this corneal size is much bigger than 11 millimeters. It's almost 11.7 millimeters in this particular eye. So that's one key factor. In the previous map, we would have, if we had even designed that lens um, and ordered it, we would have made a lens which was uh, too small. If we go to the spectacle, and just purely for design's point of view, not for 
ability to actually manufacture and dispense this product. Let's keep the prescription the same, and then we'll do another withdrawal prescription afterwards. Um, so this is the same prescription that was mentioned previously, and we'll design this lens, and we'll see how the simulation comes out. Let's let it do its thing. Right, so now almost immediately, I think everyone can probably note that this lens design looks infinitely better than the previous. So rather than having to muck around with all the tilt and all those sorts of things because of our improper capture or you know a map which wasn't essentially ideal, we now can use the software to do what it was designed to do and that's um, really good virtual fitting. Look at some of the key features here. We're looking at um, a even landing where the lens has been placed on the eye by the virtual software. We're looking at the um, edge lift here, and that's you know between 80 and 100 plus. That's looking great. The only thing that we'd probably want to comment on, and I'll get Charles' Charles' opinion on this, is um, actually something that we we talk about a lot, and that's um, looking at the delta sag. Remember that. What this software will do is it automatically analyzes the elevation to determine whether or not a toric is needed. And the threshold for that is when there's a 30 micron difference in the meridians, it will automatically create a toric lens. Um, so, Shao, do you want to have a, any comments, first of all, on just um, on the simulation or anything that I've missed there? Yeah, I, I think you, you've great, uh, done a great summary there. And, and again, this illustrates uh, the importance of, of a good map. So instantly with that well-centered map, iSpace did its thing. You've got that balanced um, bearing zone sitting there. Um, so just looking at the design overall, important to note from the previous map to this map, we've switched from a, from a torical design to a rotationally symmetric design. So the two things I would normally look at is the delta sag at the nine millimeter cord, which is currently at 28 microns. So our criteria for switching to a toric would be when that value is above 30. My other test is if we go to the alignment curve at the 12 and six o'clock position on the simulation, if you click in the center of the alignment curve, both those values should be above 30 to switch over to a toric design. In our case, both values are under the 30 mark. And again, both then the delta sac, that's 28, clicking under the alignment curve that's under 30, shows us we need to stay with a rotationally symmetrical design. The other key factor is what we would have done in the past is just to ensure we still get a good seal is to enlarged lens diameter. So by default, iSpace now designs the lens to a larger format. So again, we're that 0.2 millimeters smaller than H3ID, so at 11.5. So the larger lens helps to stabilize the lens design over a, a very mild um, astigmatic cornea, and it helps to stabilize the centration of the lens and still ensures a, a good seal. So in this case, the design is perfect. We don't need to alter anything else on here. We still have to deal with the fact that we uh, have that residual astigmatism. So again, if we go to add to cart, you will note that um, we have that residual astigmatism present. So great question. That's a great question, Jason. Um, so if you, if it. If it's you know kind of on the thirty mark, do you just start on a um, with a rotationally symmetric lens there, shell, or what's your opinion? I've got a very clear opinion on it. I like to keep my life pretty simple, so I start with the simplest answer first. And if there, I'm having trouble, then I use one of my remakes, and I'll then order a toric afterwards. Yeah, um, I do agree. If if it's right bang on on thirty. Um, it's going to be one of those borderline cases and you're absolutely right. We try and keep it simple. One of the other things I'll look at is the spectacle prescription and corneal astigmatism. Um, you, in cases where there's mild lenticular astigmatism, 
I want to keep it a, a RS design. Um, and I actually want to encourage a bit of under correction happening in the vertical. We want to maintain some of that um, corneal astigmatism to make sure we can counteract the lenticular astigmatism. Where is if my residual astigmatism is quite low, I might switch over to a toric design if it's 30 and above, um, as that will ensure we're getting a, a correct reshape happening in the vertical meridian. We remove all the corneal astigmatism um, and therefore um, we get a, a, a better residual description coming out afterwards. Now, now, just for the sake of discussion, um, let's just switch from a from that um, issue we've got with the cylinder and the spectacle prescription not being in alignment there, Shell, and go to continuing discussion on this case with a minus 250, minus 1 at 180, which is more realistic to the prescription and the corneal um, astigmatism that we've got. Um, so, you'd, so if you were to look at this case, and it's one diopter of cylinder, and you've got this map, I would still order a rotation symmetric, but let's say that the astigmatism was two diopters, would you then expect anything different or what would your management be? Um, so the risk is if we design a, a toric lens and the delta sag at nine is less than 30 microns, we, we run the risk of the lens not sitting stable on the cornea. In other words, we, we might expect rotation to occur. So instead of that lens sitting where the lens simulation shows it's gonna sit, every night that lens might move around by a number of degrees on, on the axis. Um, and that results in a very unstable reshape over a period of time. It also affects the way the lens central tear film relationship will be to the cornea. So if we take this design you've just done now and do a duplicate of a Jagrit. So if you don't mind right clicking on that design and just duplicate that design for me. Yep. So you right click duplicate. Um, and this is a really good idea to do when you're working on a design or tweaking a design. Just duplicate the lens. So you've got your old parameters, you can review the new ones um, whenever you're looking at things. Okay, Michelle? Yeah, and if you now want to go to and, and design it for me as a toric, so to do that, we just click on the rotation symmetric tab and switch over to a toric design. And we click optimize for the software to optimize the lens. So what the software is doing is it's grabbing that corneal data and it's redesigning a toric specific lens for that cornea. And so if we look at the simulation when it's going to come up, you're going to go, ooh, that actually looks quite good. Um, let's go through the design principles. First step's always tilt. So we're going to go to tilt and position and we're going to click the top side of the lens. So we can get a well-balanced corneal bearing pattern. So in this case, again, we're looking for that triangular type of pattern, which we now have. And just to make sure everything is as best as we can get it, we're gonna click optimize again and ask the software just to redesign the lens based on the new tilt um, position on the cornea. And so, Darren, is there another question there? Or was that just another comment? Or Darren and Angela, there's another question there. Or is there is that a comment that's just been added? It's a comment. It says uh, from Dr. Mahler to everyone, if you actually have this minus one uh, AR refractively in one diopter with the rule cornea, even the average delta of 35 micron difference, wouldn't you still want a rotationally symmetrical lens so as to not reduce the with the rule corneal cylinder? Um, I absolutely, yeah, exactly. I absolutely agree with that statement, um, and and I just want to reinforce uh, what Dr. Malas just said there, and this is kind of we are aiming with what we're doing here. So the risk is if we design a toric lens on a cornea with insufficient elevation, there is a risk of this lens rotating off axis. And I just want to show you what happens in a case like this. So if we go to to tilt and position. 
um, on the simulation. So when Jagrid clicks on that tilt in position tab, we can ask the software to simulate that lens when it rotates off axis. So we're gonna click on the lens stabilization button on the right there. And we're just gonna tell the software, please simulate this lens for me um, 45 degrees off its, its axis point. So currently it says the lens will rotate um, slightly clockwise. Minus seven. Um, uh, it doesn't matter, just pop in, let's say 45 degrees there. You just want to see what happens to the whole fit relationship when we do that. So we click apply. And so Jagger is just going to balance that out for us quickly. So again, we're going to click on the opposite direction of where the blue um, pattern is. And so we're going to click a number of times. Now keep in mind what we're trying to do here is simulate to you what happens when that lens rotates off axis. So if we go back to simulation tab. Yeah, Oops, give me a second. Just move that back. Um, yep. You can see the whole fit relationship has changed. We're getting an increased central tear film thickness. Um, the alignment curves might be slightly off in its alignment. So although it might look like a good fit when you go to a toric, the moment that toric lens rotates off axis, the fit becomes non-ideal. And so that's why we don't want to fit a toric lens unless we're absolutely confident that lens will lock into, into position. Carl, I have and a question for, here. Um, yep. Do you recommend leaving about 20 to 25 microns of central clearance or just leave the optimized setting as is? I would leave it as the optimized setting and the only time I will change that manually is if the clinical science will, will dictate that we need to do this. So what can possibly happen is if you fit the lens and you notice after a week or so that there's central staining um, and you're absolutely sure this is not from the removal process in the mornings, then I would go in and manually increase that central tear from thickness by five to 10 microns. In our knowledge base, um, there is an article talking about central staining and the whole process involved with the central stain. But I would leave it on the default value, whatever I space the side it needs to be. So the other point that Dr. Mailer was making is if we go back to our rotationally symmetrical design. Yep, just give us a second. Um, the Computers are slower here in New Zealand. <laughs> All right, so this example is the one with the 180 degrees. So if we go and click on add to cart. So we can see our residual astigmatism here is minus 050 diopters. Now keep in mind, this is the residual description that you would expect with the lens on eye. Now, if we have these cases where that value is 0 0.5, 0 0.075, we want to encourage a bit of under correction happening in the vertical, because that slight astigmatism that we can keep intact will help to counteract the lenticular astigmatism that we find. So again, if that residual value is in the higher minus one, minus one to five, you want to encourage a bit of tear film presence in the vertical alignment curve, meaning you want that 15, 20, 25 microns of uh, space sitting between the alignment curve and the cornea, encouraging a bit of under correction happening in, in that meridian. So those are the, the kind of tips and tricks that we, we look at when to decide, um, when to decide designing a rotationally symmetric lens or a toric lens. Now, even when designing a toric lens and there is a increased residual astigmatism, we can on purpose increase the space in the vertical meridian. So if we go to our toric design and like Jagrut's on right now, and we go to the Z zone and we look at the steep meridian, that's 320, we can increase um, the space there. In other words, we want to 
decrease the amount of um, Z zone in that area. So to encourage more distance between the alignment curve and the cornea. So to do that, we're gonna just change that value in this case by 10 microns. We're gonna click apply. And so what we're doing is because all the weight is sitting on the horizontal alignment curve by decreasing the Z zone in the vertical, we are effectively picking that foot up. We're moving it away from the cornea. So if we click on the alignment curve at 12 and six o'clock, you'll see that there is a central tear film thickness of eight microns sitting over there. And if we click on the inferior quadrant, uh, which is the um, six o'clock position, that's about seven microns. So because we want to encourage a bit of undercorrection happening there, we can increase the space there even further. And this will take us back to 300 microns, for instance. So if we look at the steep meridian, if we go to the Z zone, it's currently 310 microns. If we change that value to 300 microns and click apply. Now in this case, we click apply and not optimize. If we click optimize, the software will try and get that alignment curve as close as possible in the vertical. Because we don't want that, we have to click apply and just tell the software do what we ask you to do. Now, if we click again on the 12 and six o'clock position of the alignment curve, you'll notice the central tear film thickness has increased further. Interestingly enough, if we now look at our design, we've essentially moved that toric design back to the RS design. So there's almost no difference between the flat and the steep meridians. And, and so that road will lead us back to just simply designing a rotation symmetric lens versus the toric. So that would be the decision-making process. Um, the point that we wanna highlight with this whole troubleshoot was the importance of grabbing a good map. You saw when we used the decentered map, how much effort and work we had to put in to get the design as good as we can. And even then the design didn't look optimal. The moment we used a geometrically centered map and the prescription and the corneal data agreed with one another, the whole design process became simplified, made sense and was easy to do. And this is why it's so key and important that we need to take time to capture good maps. Um, it just makes the whole process of designing and fitting as easy as possible. If we go back, to the original lens we did um, on the decentered map. Let's look at what we've done there. So here we've designed a, a toric lens. Um, and if you would simply grab that information and then put it onto the other map, you would notice that the fit wasn't optimal. So that's the lens you would have ordered, placed it on the eye, and we would have probably ended up with a lens that's decentering and not fitting optimal. Whereas if we used the correct map, we would have ended up with a rotationally symmetric lens. So Jagrid, if you wanna to go to our, our final lens. So maybe let's just delete all the stuff we don't want. So on that map, we used a against the rule. So let's delete that for instance. So to delete the map, you just right click on it. Um, the option is there then to either duplicate or delete. So that's the map we want to keep. And so we're going to delete all the other stuff. Now that we're happy, we've run through the different simulations. We, we know what we're after. So if we go back to the map that we want to use. Yeah, so that's this one here. Um, yeah. And just for argument's sake, and to say that we could, we it was possible to do that other that lens design. If we're comparing from the pre map, which was this design here, where we the software incorrectly decided there was 38 microns of difference because of the decentration of the format capture, we had to muck around with this lens to get it right. We simply imported this map, which was significantly better, designed the lens, and it came out with the optimal result instantly. From there, we just add it to the shopping cart, design the left eye, add it to the shopping cart, and then submit the order. 
All right, so Shao, um, first of all, before we go on to the next, uh, the next example, are there any questions at this stage? I'm not seeing any uh, additional questions. So once again, I'll just remind everybody, if you get a chance, please snap a selfie of yourself during the, the webinar. We're coming up on an hour, and so some of you may be leaving us, but those that uh, would like to continue, please stay tuned and we'll continue on. Charles and Jagrit. Yeah, I think yeah, we'll, so we'll have time for, for one more, Jagrit. So if you want to grab yeah. us another interesting case, let's run through it quickly. All right, well, let's put this out to the viewers. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of options. We've got an asymmetric elevation uh, option. So this is where, this might be a case that's more similar to everyone's practice where they have, oh, they've got this eye and there's quite a difference in the elevation. That could be, that's an option we could go through. We go through an against the rule example. And this is a pretty even against the rule. We've also got a, a limbus to limbus astigmatism versus an apical. So we could do, we could go through an example of what we're looking at there. Um, and the final one is an interesting cornea. This is just something that's just odd. Um, so anyone have any sort of preference what we'd like to go through and then um, oh, just to let everyone know, so Charles hasn't seen any of these maps before, um, so he's flying a bit blind, and these are all just patients of mine that um, I've come in and just made sure we can collect the right data for everyone. They weren't the um, odd one. For, for demonstration. <laughs> I knew one. it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, my, my, my first advice is don't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, well, shall, um, okay. So let's have a look at the map first. Okay. So this is a patient who's coming. I've created obviously a geometrically centered map here. So this is the first part. Um, and you know what, they just actually have some variable, variable vision. You know, that's what they really have. Um, and it's no surprise why, and that's actually why we took out the topographer. And I just thought, look, this would be a great case to talk about for, you know, would someone fit this, would they not? So first of all, um, we'll make up a case. We'll say they're a, a minus 350 myope. Um, and so, they, Jack Reed, so, be, before yeah. we even start in and, and designing the lens, I've got a couple of questions. So for me, yeah, sure. it, it's unusual to see a cornea like this have normal indices and I would assume the patient has uh, good visual acuity, 6.6 six or, or near 6.6 six VA, am I correct? Uh, yeah, they have near 6.6 six VA, um, but they do have a bit of a dry eye. Okay, so that would be my, my next question. When you see these, uh, and again, to, to view these maps when I capture, I like the tangential curvature. So if you mind just showing me the tangential curvature first. Yeah, sure. Um, so again, I'm going for my island in the sea analogy. Um, cool. It's a really so big island. The, the, yeah, it's my island. So the first thing I want to see is a round circular island. And I'm not seeing that. So my question is one, has the tear layer on this eye and two is the patient rubbing their eye so in experience we find that um, you get these slightly asymmetrical shapes when patients rub their eyes frequently you get these horizontal rubs or these flat palm rubs or knuckle rubs and that can create that very mild distortion on the cornea which gives you a near normal cornea when you look at the indices but can get you a visual acuity of 6666 six, six minus one or 2020 20 minus one minus two. So my first step always is to go and check the tear layer, which I think is what you're doing next. And also to make sure that you're not dealing with a allergic prone person who's rubbing their eyes on a frequent basis. Yeah, so um, yeah, absolutely. So let's have a look at this cornea now. So the, obviously the devil's in the detail and um, probably it's just an interesting cornea more for, you know, the amount of dry eye that we miss as practitioners, I'd say, um, when fitting contact lenses, and it can solve a lot of problems, especially when people think initially, oh, I've got to change material, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Just having a really good tear films are quite important. So if we really scrutinize this map, you're going to see these little areas of ring jam here and here. Um, you're going to see where the lashes have come through and provided a little bit of inconsistent data. 
because the lash obviously creates a shadow, the shadow is interpreted in the placido disc. Um, other other uh, methods of capturing topography or tomography are, are going to show um, a different shape uh, artifacts. So then we have a look here, and we have a look at. So we now know, hey, look, maybe this map, maybe this isn't exactly what the cornea should look like, because you saw those areas there. There's a lot of lash um, shadow here, and the areas of uh, variability within the placido image. So I would first look at recapturing this map. But let's say that this is the map that we got. Um, are there any other considerations you'd want to look at next, Charles? After you've had a look at your island, um, you've checked the um, the placido image. Is there anything else you'd want to look at? Uh, we can have a quick look at elevation. Yeah, that's always a good way to go. Sure. Um, so, not too bad. Yeah. So, I mean, so what does this tell us? It tells us, well, look, if I put a lens on eye, it's roughly going to center somewhere. It's not like, but not looking like it's overly going to go in one direction versus another. All right. So let's now look at importing this map into the eye space. I don't think it's in there yet. Oh yeah, cool it is. Uh, awesome. And uh, we'll have a look at designing a lens, eh? So uh, what do we want to design there, Shao? Uh, let's go with the forge and, and see what happens. Right. Again, just looking at, at that map, um, I'm a bit nervous doing author K on this one until I know for sure where that difference in, in um, asymmetry is coming from. Yeah, so if I was if I was going to fit this case and I'd seen this, um, I would be really treating my dry eye first, and you know, I use in my clinic products like IPL, Lipiflow, or that sort of thing, um, and I make sure the tear film is just bolstered uh, as well as I can, at, just before fitting and during fitting. Um, spectacle prescription there, Shell. What should we do? Oh, let's go with, Jason, yep. went, Jason says, Jag, how dry is too dry? Do you have a general guide or mixed blood value that tells you it's contraindicated? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, or, yeah, so, um, of, so yeah, yeah, good, good, good question, Jason. So, um, I don't believe that dry eye is necessarily a contraindication for ortho care as long as you've treated and managed it well. But then that leads on to a whole different discussion around the management of dry eye. And so I can I can talk to others at any stage. You can just privately uh, contact me about an algorithm we're developing using um, all of the different uh, tests and dry eye tests that we use in clinical practice to try and navigate that minefield um, in, a, in a sort of a traffic light system. Um, the big, obviously, the area of research that's missing from the dryer workshop too, is that um, they know that these diagnostic tests exist, um, but we don't know what specific treatments treat what type of dry eye. And really there's a combination of everything in it with the majority being MGD. So I, I have a rule of thumb where I just, if I see any sort of dryness with soft contact lens fitting, rigid lens fitting, um, that I just treat that. So that might be conservatively with um, drops and washes. It might go all the way up to, um, uh, in office procedures or at home procedures. Um, okay, so sorry, Shao, you were saying, what was the script we want to do? Yeah, just on, on a practical level, uh, Jason, when it comes to dry eyes, you, you, you need to make sure that the corneal surface is, is healthy. Obviously, we, we can't fit these lenses if there's already punctate staining on the cornea. Um, research done by, by a number of people have shown if there's breaks in the epithelial, and you sleeping with an orthocal lens, there's an increased risk of developing pseudomonial uh, ulcers. So that would be one of my first signs is if there's punctate staining prior to fitting, you wanna treat that and get that resolved. When you capture the map, there should be enough tears there to get a decent deceda disc image. And then obviously you gotta manage the whole process of sleeping with the lens at night. So lubricants for insertion, lubricants for removal. One of the practical tips I'll give people is in the mornings when the patient wakes up, and this is a process you need to teach all of them, is to install some form of lubricating drop immediately upon awakening. 
and then using the bottom lid, nudge the lens or break the seal of the lens until there's fluid flowing underneath the lens and the lens lifts away from the cornea. So from the patient experience side, when they put a drop in, they nudge it, they blink a number of times. If they can feel the lens moving freely, they can then remove the lens. If the lens is not moving freely, give it a minute, put another drop in, nudge the lens, break the seal, blink until the lens moves. Now, the risk is if that is a very dry patient and the lens is adherent to the cornea and they just pull it off with the DMV um, remover, there's a high risk that they can pull some of those epithelial cells off with the lens. And this is typically where you get that complication of early morning reduced vision that gradually improves as the day progresses. And some people might also um, tell you that there was a slight discomfort or pain when they remove the lens in the morning or certain mornings, it's normally intermittent. So you get this intermittent pain in the mornings, this intermittent reduced visual acuity that improves in the day. My first troubleshoot there is to go back and look at the removal process and just remind the patient to install drops, nudge the lens before they remove the lens, make sure the lens moves freely and that should eliminate all those risks, which is more commonly seen with the drier eye patients and the high power patients. Also the point, sorry if I can speak, the point yep. that you made about uh, the pre-SPK from, um, the SPK from pre-fitting, um, sometimes I find after you do the ortho care on these patients, their cornea actually looks better, uh, less dry, especially when you've, in, in examples where we've done a unilateral um, ortho care. And, yeah, um, um, and I think that that's a valid point, Jason. It's um, the, the lens actually acts as a bit of a, a, a wetting blanket there, and it, it protects the, the epithelial from the top lids. Um, but also with that whole process, you're lubricating more often. Um, there's a fluid blanket sitting there in the evenings. So um, it's definitely not a contraindicator when you're dealing with dry eyes. But obviously, like Jagrit says, there's a whole um, paradigm of, of procedures that you need to follow. Um, and he's got a very, very good system. And so I highly encourage you guys to chat to him or maybe we can get him to do a lecture series just highlighting some of those issues going forward. Okay, so just um, to finish up, we'll probably do another, I don't know, say five or so minutes on this. Um, obviously, this example has designed a lens of, I've put in a spectacle description of minus 450, okay? Um, so, as you can see there, Shell, we've got We've got to obviously address the tilt and position of this lens. Um, we've got a, a steeper area in this area of the cornea that yep. we need to kind of account for. And the big yep. thing here is stabilization. So I suppose this is probably where we want to talk about the differences in the new version of the software and the previous version in terms of diameter, overall diameter. Yeah, so one of the things we've, we've definitely noticed over over a period of, of time doing a number of troubleshoots is most of the troubleshoots that we did ended up requiring a large lens. So what we found by going larger in diameter, the lenses tended to stabilize a lot better. Um, and it, you also got a better reshape process from these large lenses. And that's why we, we made the decision that lenses by standard design needs to go larger and that's why all the designs will now come out as a 0 0.2 smaller than HVID. Looking at this particular fit, I'm very happy to see that we can fit a rotationally symmetric lens. It's always more simpler trying to fit an irregular shape if we're dealing with, with an RS design. So Jagger has just tilted that lens um, so we can get our lens bearing um, more even. What I am concerned about is my lens bearing is more noticeable in the vertical than the horizontal, which is not ideal. It means that there can be a slight risk of the lens moving in, in a lateral manner. So that's just something we can keep an eye on. If we go back to the simulation process, um, we, can you just optimize the lens for us? Because that two microns is probably a little bit too close. Um, so while that's optimizing, there's a couple of features that um, we just need to look at. The first thing is, if you look at that lens design, and specifically we're looking at the, let's call it four o'clock position of the alignment curve, 
you'll notice there's a bit of bleeding that's happening there. So that fluorescein is not well demarcated at that point where Jagra just clicked and you get this slight fluid inflow. Now that's not normal. The moment I see that in the simulation, I know that my corneal map is not regular. So not knowing the map, I would have gone back and looked at the quality of the map, centration, ring jam, all that kind of stuff. We know bringing this map in, that there was irregularity there, and that's why we see that slight bleeding effect. But for any troubleshoot, when you do a design, if you see that bleeding effect in the alignment curve, stop. For me, that's a red light. I would go back and, and revisit my map. So let's say we want to go ahead with this fit. What can we do to improve it? The first thing I'm noticing is my alignment curves are too flat. So if we look at the cross sections, we call that a, a heel fit, meaning the area of the reverse curve where it comes in, where alignment curve starts, call that the heel, um, and then the opposite side, the toe. So what's happening here is this is the reverse curve, our lens is sitting like this and it's creating a bit of a wedge as Jaguar is showing there. So here I will have to go in manually and change the alignment curve value. So in order to steepen that alignment curve. So Jaguar has just done that. We can't click optimize now. We have to click apply. And the software will re-simulate that alignment curve. Now we want that alignment curve to be at a slight alignment or down angle over the horizontal meridian. So in this case, we are still too flat. So we want to go even steeper. I will go with probably 6.75. Click apply. And the other thing you'll notice, because we're going steeper on the alignment curve, our central tear form thickness has increased. Now, again, we can't click optimize in this case because it will change the alignment curve value back to its original. So we have to manually go into the Z zone and reduce the value by a good 20 microns there. Uh, currently, the central tear form thickness is 37, so 20 off of that should give us about a 17 micron central tear form thickness. Um, because we've changed the alignment curve, we need to change the tilt again. So the relationship has changed a bit. So Jagger is just tilting into the opposite direction. And I think what this really shows is the criticalness of your pre-map, um, treating any uh, anterior surface ocular conditions you've got. Um, but but like Ken said, it's a um, it's something that, you know, it's these little checklists that we do before we fit a patient or accept a patient, they just save us so much chair time in the end. You know, they, it, really, um, it really helps us with pre-empting our troubleshooting, uh, managing patients well, and doing the best job we can for our um, patients. So if you want to click back on simulation, what Jagger has just done is just balance out the, the lens bearing on the lens. Um, we still have a bit of bearing more on the vertical than the horizontal, which is not ideal. The only defense we have for that is to enlarge the lens, which we've done, and we just want to make sure the horizontal edge lift is around about 100 microns. Yeah. So, I mean, look, this is one of those cases that I wanted to, I wanted to put it in because we do see these cases in real life, and we could have gone through cases which this is the first time Michelle's seen it but we could have gone through cases which you know we designed perfectly but that's unfortunately not real life practice we can still fit a lot of these cases this particular case like i said i'd be treating that dryer first and i'd be retaking some maps and then i'd be looking at the design the notes for consideration are obviously where this lens is bearing and the way we have controlled for that is by making the lens larger and that's native in the software now um, and then we, if we were going to you know, choose to continue putting this patient, we would uh, review this fit and then we'd uh, troubleshoot accordingly if required. Excellent. I think the, the, the important message we wanted to bring across today, um, we're so keen on, on starting the ortho process with the patient that we just want to gather the maps, gather the prescription, get the design in and get going. And, and so the patient is, is 
is comfortable with that, you're comfortable with that, you're excited to do this. And then when you fit the lens, you start dealing with all these troubleshooting issues and it becomes a very uncomfortable process. Mistrust tends to develop from the patient's side. And instead of having fun doing it, it becomes work and you kind of shy away from it from, from the next case. Whereas if we take our time, do the explanatory process properly, the patient knows exactly what to expect. We prepare our cornea in the best way that we can. Um, and so when we finally get the captured map, we've got a pristine map, then the whole design process becomes a lot simpler. And then the end result should be um, easy and quick to do with good results coming off it. So it's almost like painting a house. The hard work lies in the preparation. The, the painting itself, the designing and fitting should be a quick, straightforward process. So slow the whole process down, spend time and getting the cornea as healthy as you can by following all the dry protocols that, that you have to your disposal. Take your time, get the best map that you possibly can. The design will then take care of itself and the fitting process should be quite simple following that. So if, if you have that information, if you got that from our lecture today, um, your troubleshooting should decrease by, by, by a big number and the whole process should be a lot easier to do going forward. Uh, Cheryl, Shiri would like to know why you wouldn't use a toric lens. On this eye? Um, specifically the one that we're looking at right now, again, if we look at the delta sag, we look at the, that's 28 microns. Um, and again, so the criteria is we need that 13 microns or higher. Um, to fit this eye. So on that... And also really remember, yeah, and also remember that a rotation asymmetric lens will correct between 50 and 75 percent of the corneal astigmatism. If you've got a wonder up the sill, you're going to be correcting half to three quarters of a doctor of sill. So you, you'll have a residual of 025 doctors of cylinder. There's no reason why you wouldn't in this particular case, and let's say it was at 180, sorry, um, there's no reason why in this particular case that you wouldn't consider a, a rotation symmetric first. So it is a combination of the corneal cylinder, spectacle prescription, location of this uh, cylinder as well. Jagri, can you go back to that, that previous case, the irregular cornea? Oh yeah, the, uh, hang on, the interesting case. The interesting, interesting case. Cornea. So that was the, the one Sherry, yeah, that was the one Sherry was asking is. Oh, I'm not... sorry, Sherry. Um, was it the other eye, the right eye? Oh, no, I think it's over here, uh, this one here. It's probably put in, yeah, this yeah. is the one. So just to answer Sherry's question, um, first of all, in, in this case, her question is why, why did we not do a toric? So what she's trying to ask is well, why don't we use a toric, design the lens so the alignment curve in the horizontal carries most of the weight. The answer here is if you look at your delta sag at nine millimeters, it's only 18 microns. There's not enough elevation difference to lock that lens into position. So should we do this as a toric um, and we optimize it? Yeah, and I'll just uh, separate them so we can look at the two. Um, one of the things is also, yeah, so remember, this is the, one of the traps and I think um, uh, those that have been designing in software will will um, will agree to is you can sometimes get stuck on um, trying to make a pretty picture but does it change your clinical outcome um, and that's something that's pretty important that's really what we're trying to explain here so you know if you can't get a, 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 a lens to lock on a toric cornea because there's not enough tericity is it worth doing you know and possibly not Hey, we have one final question, if you don't, uh, if you don't mind. This is from, uh, not from our Charles, but from another Charles. Is it now possible to do back optic surface torax to correct residual astigmatism? Um, you can do a back optic zone radius toric, but there's, there's three criteria that needs to meet. Um, one is your corneal astigmatism and your spectacle prescription, the axis there needs to be in the same meridians, more or less by 20 degrees. The lens rotation 
also needs to be within 20 degrees. So all three of those areas needs to be in the same meridian. So if your flat K is at 180, your spectacle prescription is at 180 or 90, and your lens rotation is at 180 or 90, then you can start playing with back optic zone radiuses. But if any of those three ones differ by 20 degrees, they won't all line up and you just end up having residual astigmatism that's oblique. And then to try and troubleshoot from there is, is difficult. And that's allowing that the cornea has enough elevation difference to lock a toric lens into position. So you need to meet a number of criteria before you can exercise a back optic zone radius uh, toric design. So in, in not all cases, one of the other ways of trying to correct it is, as I said earlier, is to not optimize the fit. So let's say uh, it's a with the rule um, cornea and there's a bit of against the rule residual astigmatism coming through and you are fitting a toric lens by decreasing the Z zone value of the steep meridian. In other words, we're lifting the alignment curve away from the cornea in the steep meridian. We're essentially reducing the amount of myopia we can correct in that area. And that might leave some residual corneal astigmatism behind that then counteracts the lenticular astigmatism. But it gets complex and you, you need to do these power grids and, and look at where all your meridians and powers lie. There's an excellent document that Jagrit wrote on our knowledge base on fitting toric lenses that, that really highlights all these different issues and explains the, in more detail what I've just said. Um, so the long answer, the uh, short answer is um, sometimes, but not always. So the short answer, an even shorter answer is yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you have a look at this, so it's just a quick example. Um, your delta K of three and a half diopters, you've done a design, but you need to have four and a half diopters of spectacle prescription corrected. By use, utilizing a toric back optic zone radius, a toric reverse curve and a toric alignment curve, um, although this lens uh, reshaping may take a bit longer than a traditional uh, reshaping process, it can still happen, okay? Um, and so, yes, you can use toric back optic zones, but as Shell said, there are certain rules, and that's why we'd encourage you to um, contact us, contact Darren, contact Kendra in Australia, and um, Charles now in, in New Zealand, and uh, his team at Innovative Contacts in South Africa and, and South Africa, if you have these questions, because we're talking now about complex cases, and that was the purpose of this lecture. Last week, we did a, a kind of an introduction beginners. This is more for our other practitioners who have been with us for a while. Look, we hope that was really helpful for everyone. Um, Darren and Charles and Angela, do you have any other final words? Or if there are any other questions, we can maybe continue those offline or? Yes, I put, the, I put their email address in the comments. Um, so if you, if you would like to just send us an email with your questions. Again, you know, I just want to remind everyone that any of our lenses that are manufactured in the Babushin Lao material do get the extended six month even out of the uh, quarantine status that we're in. So that's a, a, something that we really would like to stress. Um, at any time, if you wanna have a session with Darren, let us know and that should probably wrap it up. Thank you, Angela. And just um, from our side, if you wanna learn more about uh, capturing good maps, if you go to our iSpace website, that's iSpaceLenses.com, just look under the blog section. One of the blogs, or there's a, a series of three blogs that will go step by step on how to capture good topography maps for the use for virtual fitting. We also have the extensive knowledge base that's also available from the iSpaceLenses.com website with all the information regarding everything we've done today. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact Darren. If you are zooming in from South Africa, please contact Mariska. If you're in New Zealand or Australia, um, please contact myself or Kendra in Australia. We're more than happy to do one-on-one -on -one sessions on Zoom. So if you have a group of practitioners or particular troubleshoots that you want us to go through during this time of lockdown, 
please just email us um, and we'll try and set up a Zoom meeting as soon as possible where we can do one-on-ones or group troubleshoots. Um, if there's no further questions, uh, we're going to say goodbye and look out for our next one in roughly a week's time again. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.